To start electromagnetism, we're going to work on, uh, we're going to talk about Coulomb's law today. I want to talk about what charged particles are. Uh, then we'll get into uh, the equation for Coulomb's law. We'll talk about the permittivity of free space. And I just love the word permittivity. It makes me feel smart. And then we'll talk about how to use uh, um, Coulomb's law for uh, multiple point charges. Okay, so let's so let's begin. Um, we have uh, charged particles. And really, there's, there's only two charged particles that we're going to worry about in here. And that's, uh, you remember from chemistry, you've got, you know, I mean, matter is made out of protons, mm -hmm. neutrons, and electrons. Pretty much all the matter that matters is made out of these three particles. <laughs> yeah, see what I did there? Now, um, shh. Now, in, in, in particle accelerators and atom smashers, and so we, we create these exotic particles and so on, and, and they are a part of nature, and there's these things called neutrinos, and there's, there's all kinds of wonderful little particles that exist in nature, but this is what matters. Um, this is what you are. You are protons, neutrons, and electrons. And now, it turns out, and this is the way nature is, it turns out that protons and electrons carry a, uh, a property that we call charge. And we've assigned them, uh, uh, now the neutrons, they're neutral, we say that they have no charge. So they don't do this. Protons have what's called uh, positive charge. And electrons uh, have negative charge. Now, this, these assignments of, of, of positive and negative are strictly arbitrary. Um, it's based on what Benjamin Franklin did, you know, 200 and something years ago. Uh, and it was, uh, he ended up giving what um, turned out to be protons positive charge and what turned out to be electrons negative charge. Uh, Benjamin Franklin did not know about protons, neutrons, or electrons. That didn't come, that knowledge was not available for another, well, 200 years. But, or, you know, but he, he we, we have known about sh static electric charge. And we've known that there's two kinds of static electric charge. And, um, but what carries this charge are the, the protons and uh, electrons. Now, if something has charge, that means that it can apply what we call an electric force to other particles that have charge. So it's kind of a circular definition. Yeah. So wait, are you saying that like they're arbitrarily assigned in that like protons are positive in the same way? Like oh, it, it was, if only Benjamin Franklin had assigned them differently, E and M would be a little bit easier. It would have been nice if he assigned the positive charge to electrons and the negative charge to what turned out to be protons. Because what flows in wires, what current is, and we're going to study that later, is the flow of electrons. Um, it would have been nice, uh, but, but current is defined to be the flow of positive charge. So we're going to get to all that later, but what, but what I'm saying is that positive and negative w was arbitrary. Uh, it could have. It could have been. In fact, after World War II, okay. After World War II, um, the military tried to switch it. They said, well, "Let's give electrons positive charge and protons negative charge." The problem is, it's stuck. I mean, every textbook uh, written up to that point had this assignment, and we, we've we've stayed with it. It's kind of like the QWERTY keyboard on your on your computers. The QWERTY keyboard. That arrangement of letters was designed to slow down the speed of typing because the typewriters were so clunky that they were getting, people were getting so good at typing that the letters started jamming. So they arranged the keyboard to slow the typist down as much as possible. The QWERTY keyboard, the keyboard that's on your laptop right now, is the most inefficient uh, uh, arrangement of letters by design. 
Now there are other keyboards that are more efficient, but nobody uses them because everybody's learned the QWERTY. So uh, anyway, let's, um, let's move on here. It turns out that if you have a collection of positive charge and another collection of positive charge, uh, these collection of charges will apply four equal and opposite forces to each other that will repel. They repel each other. If you have a collection of negative charge, that is a little basket full of electrons, these charges will attract. I mean, sorry, no, they don't attract. They, they repel. Getting ahead of myself. They also repel. But if you have opposite charges, protons and electrons apply an attractive force, an equal and opposite attractive force to each other. Now, the, this is what we mean by charge. Uh, a char, if an object has charge, it is either attracted or repelled electrically uh, to other objects that have charge. And so uh, we have, uh, so it's these charged particles that cause the electric force. Now, the first thing we need to do is have a unit for a collection of charge. Like here I've got a big basket of charge here. If I've got a whole bunch of charge, we, we say that that amount of charge is one coulomb of charge, named after a guy named Coulomb. Now one coulomb of charge turns out to be a whole heck of a lot of electrons, or a whole heck of a lot of protons. But this definition was made before we knew about protons and electrons. It was made based on, it, really what it is, it's based on the amount of charge that flows by if you have um, in one second if you have one volt across one ohm of resistance. But we haven't gotten to any of that yet. So just think of it right now as a big huge collection of charge. One coulomb of charge is a heck of a lot of charge. Okay. So in fact most of the with uh, electrostatics which is what we're dealing with here with Coulomb's law most of the the amount of charge is going to be a tiny fraction of a coulomb of charge. Uh, in fact, most of, most of what we're going to be doing are, is dealing with microcoulombs. Like I might say, hey, uh, we have a charge here. And we might say, hey, this amount of charge right here could be six microcoulombs. Now this is a, uh, we use capital C to stand for coulomb. Now a microcoulomb is just a cool, uh, this is actually equal to 6. And what does micro mean? Times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. So this is micro right here, is times 10 to the negative 6. And this is the amount of charge that we're going to deal with uh, in when we're dealing with, we, we usually use micro coulombs. Sometimes we even use pico coulombs. Uh, which would be like uh, you might have six picocoulombs. This would be six times ten to the negative twelve coulombs. So this is a trillionth of a coulomb. This is a millionth of a coulomb. There are nano coulombs, right? Nano is a billion times ten to the negative nine. So we're just using the the um, metric system prefixes here quite a bit. Okay, now. If we have a little uh, chunk of charge, and let's just say that this little chunk of charge, and I'm going to give it, uh, the, the variable we use for a charge is a lowercase q. And we put another charge over here. I'll call this q1, and this is q2. So this is, these are two uh, like charges, two positive charges. They're going to repel each other. They're a certain distance apart. I'll call that R. I'm going to call these point charges. Now, point charges means that all the charge is, is 
concentrated at a single point in space. That is an approximation, but it's an approximation that works really, really well. And a guy named Coulomb did uh, electrical experiments and he measured the force uh, between these uh, two electrical charges. And we call this force the electric force, F sub E. The electric force between two point charges. And what he found is that this force was directly proportional to how much charge I had. So it's directly proportional to Q1. So if I double Q1, I'm going to double the force of repulsion between, you know, between them. And Q2, so if I double this, the amount of charge here, I would double the charge. Um, and it was inversely proportional to the distance. The farther apart they were, the weaker the electric force. But just like gravity, it got weaker by the square of the distance. Now, this is very interesting. Um, the fact that the electric force gets weaker by the square of the distance is a property of three-dimensional space. If you have a massive object, you know, a, a mass that you are considering to be a point mass, gravity spreads out in space. The effect of gravity spreads out in three-dimensional space. And it spreads out in such a way that it um, gets weaker by the square of the distance. If I had a candle giving off light, and I could measure the intensity of that light, the light from that candle gets weaker by the square of the distance because it's spreading out in three-dimensional space. Here I have what I'm going to call here in a little bit an electric field, or the effect of this charge on other charges, that spreads out in three-dimensional space. So it is a property of three-dimensional space that stuff that spreads out in three-dimensional space gets weaker by the square of the distance. Sound does the same thing. The sound of my voice is spreading out in, into the room in three-dimensional space. It gets weaker by the square of the distance. Now, these are the only things I can that, that affect how strong this force is. I can change the charges and I can change how far apart they are, and that's it. But we need, just like with gravity, I need a constant of nature that tells, that tells me how strong that force is and makes the units work. Because this is Coulomb squared per meter squared, right? I want to end up with Newtons. So I have a constant, and Coulomb did this. He did the experiment. And he came up with a value for what we call k, or k sub e. Now I'm just going to, uh, uh, here I've written k sub e. I'm, I'm just going to call it k from now on, um, lowercase k. Don't confuse it with the spring constant, right? We use lowercase k for the spring constant um, in mechanics, but in e &M we use lowercase k to represent the electric constant. And um, also called Coulomb's constant. And it turns out, when you do the experiment, that k sub e is equal to a huge number, 8.99, or you could just use 9.0, times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. <clears throat> This is a huge, huge number. Um, if I had a coulomb of charge one meter away from another coulomb of charge, there would be about nine billion newtons of repulsive force. That would be bad. You would not want to be in the area. And, a, and, and by the way, a coulomb of charge, it's pretty easy to, to collect a coulomb of charge. Well, you've got lots and lots and lots of Coulomb of charge. It's just, but, so the, the electric force is absolutely huge. This is a measure of, this is a constant of nature. It measures how strong the electric force is. Let's, let's compare it, by the way, to G.
Gravity is an incredibly weak force. In fact, to really feel much of it, you need a whole planet of mass under your feet to feel it. Okay, you are gravitationally attracted to the person you're sitting next to. So take a look at that person and, you know, do you feel the attractive force? Not, not gravity. <laughs> so, but it, if you have enough mass though, gravity becomes the strongest force in nature because there's only one kind of gravity and that's attractive gravity. But with the electric force, the electric force is incredibly strong. In fact, if you put 1% more electrons on your body right now than you already have, and the person sitting next to you put 1% more electrons than they already have right now, the repulsive force between you and the person you're sitting next to would be so great that it would exceed the weight of the earth. We would have a huge colossal megatonnage explosion. You would be pushed apart so quickly with so much force, so much energy would be released that it would be like a, a huge nuclear explosion. I mean, it would be the huge, it would probably crack open the earth. I'm not kidding. You can do the math, and we, we, we will do the math. We'll do a couple problems where we figure this out. Shh. But the electric force is strong. But happily, there are two kinds of electric force. There is the repulsive force of like charges and the attractive force of unlike charges. And you are made out of exactly the same amount of positive and negative charge. And therefore, you are not flinging each other apart or uh, you are you are um, uh, you are electrically neutral okay thank goodness now we need to account for the direction of this this is repulsive and we say that or or outwards from each other and we we have a way of saying outwards we call that our hat and we've used our hat before. Now, notice, I, with gravity, I, I had a negative R hat, right? Because it was a, an attractive force. Repulsive forces, we, we give with a positive R hat. And that just means away from the center. Now, notice something here, though. What if I had, what if Q1 was negative and Q2 was positive? This would have a negative value. It'd be attractive, and it would be a negative R hat direction for the... And, and, and this is why uh, we really still use the positive and negative that Benjamin Franklin used to distinguish the two kinds of charge rather than like A or B or purple and red or something like that uh, because mathematically it, it, it works to serve our, our purposes. Okay. Now, um, if uh, this constant K right here can be expressed differently and this is a little bit weird, um, but don't worry, there, the, the weirdness is only beginning. So just get used to weirdness. The electric constant is also equal to 1 over 4 pi times this number called epsilon naught. Now, I'm going to, you're going to learn why we use this epsilon naught when we use Gauss's law. It, later on in our studies of electromagnetism, it will be easier for us to express the electric constant in terms of epsilon naught rather than K. So it's just a matter of convenience. Um, epsilon naught is equal to um, 1 over 4 pi k and it has a value and I'll have to squeeze it in here of 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 uh, and I believe the units are meter squared per Newton Coulomb squared. Oh wait, did I get those mixed up? Ah. 
Yeah, I got to mix up. Duck on it. It's because I'm recording it and I get nervous. Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. Yeah, I'll zoom in here. Okay, now, epsilon naught is a measure of how easily electric fields, which we're going to study later, moves through a um, the vacuum of space. There are other materials that electric fields can pass through, and it changes what epsilon is. But epsilon naught, the zero here means through a vacuum. And this is called, it has a name, it's called the permittivity of free space. Free space means it's a vacuum. And you can use uh, this equation to figure out the force on charged particles. Now, if we have more than one charged particle, and let me zoom back out. If I've got a charged particle here, I'll call this Q1, and a charged particle over here, I'll call this Q2, and I want to know what is the force on Q3. Okay, so here I've got three point charges. And I want to know what is the force on Q3 due to Q1 and Q2. Okay, well, what does Q1 and Q3 do? Let's, let's just draw a free body diagram of this guy. What is Q1 doing to Q3? It's repelling it. And what direction would that be in? also known as down. Now, what force is Q3 is Q2 applying to Q3? Now, this force though has an x and y component. So based on the geometry of this problem, you're going to have to figure out what the x component or i hat and what the j hat component of this force is. You can figure out the magnitude by using Coulomb's law and then the direction and break it up into components based on the geometry. Now look at this. This is kind of nice because what is this force going to be? The force of 1 on 3? Well the force of 1 on 3 it's going to be equal to K times whatever Q1 was times whatever Q3 is uh, over this distance squared. I'll just call it R13 squared. You have to plug the numbers in there. Let me zoom in again, sorry. Now, what direction is it in? Okay, yes, we can call it the R hat direction. But by looking at the picture, I would just say, oh, this is negative j hat. And then I would take this and figure out the magnitude. And then I use sine and cosine, figure out what this angle is or whatever, and break it up into its components. And then to figure out what the overall force is, what is the net force on Q3, you just add them together as vectors. Make sure you add them together as vectors. So just to take a look at everything. I think we got through just about everything here today. Charged particles apply forces to each other, described by Coulomb's law. Remember, these are vectors. The electric force is super strong. And you add them together as vectors. All right, you guys are done. Goodbye, goodbye.